This is the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock, and we have a returning guest uh, today. He's been on the show, oh gosh, three or four times. This might even be his fifth time. He, uh, boy, he reads a lot, and they're, of course, the kind of books that are hard to obtain nowadays. We're not supposed to read these kinds of books, I suppose. Uh, and he's got a very interesting background uh, in military intelligence, and... Uh, I think he really knows his stuff. I, before I was ever ever introduced to him, I w was reading his writings online quite a bit. So it was it was uh, I was quite happy to, to finally talk to him. And he's been, he's become a regular on the show. And well, I, I, frankly, and this doesn't happen very often in life, I have trouble finding areas where I would disagree with my guest today. And our guest is Daryl Eberhardt. Welcome aboard, Daryl. And thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm 61 years old. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that on any of the podcasts. So sometimes I get a little tuckered out and tired of fighting these guys. And uh, But let me give um, your listeners uh, a, a kind of a, an introduction to me, both just the intel and the religious side, because I've got this great concern that they'll accuse, since I've been writing so much about Roman Catholicism, especially the Jesuit order, and I'm not comparing myself to Abraham Lincoln, but they, uh, whenever they were plotting to assassinate Lincoln, they uh, uh, passed the word around that in the, a lot of the northern newspapers, as a matter of fact, that were Democratic newspapers, and, and actually Lincoln claimed up to half of the newspapers in his time were controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. But they accused him of being a baptized Catholic who had gone astray. They figured that would steady the arms of the Roman Catholic assassins, and a lot of the low-level conspirators were Roman Catholic. And I just wanted to let people know that I have never been a Roman Catholic. I was never secretly baptized as a Roman Catholic. I am not an apostate Catholic, although I do know quite a bit about the Catholic Church. But anyway, let me tell them about my intel. Uh, I spent 26 years in the intelligence community, and 20 years of that was the U.S. military. I'm a retired military. Eleven and a half years uh, in the U.S. Air Force intelligence, and eight and a half years in Army intelligence. And then after I retired from the military, I worked six years as a Department of Defense civilian at the National Security Agency, uh, largely because I got trained in Russian and Arabic languages. I had worked as an analyst, a linguist, a reporter, and then later I got a direct commission to captain. So I was then in military intelligence. I was a chief warrant officer before then, after I'd switched over from the Air Force. And I'd been writing two newsletters for the past decade plus, the, tackling the tough topics and examining the tough issues. And when I first started writing, I just pretty much you know, just spoke in general terms of the globalist ritually, talked a little bit about the what are actually just front groups, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderbergers, etc. And even when I did... Uh, Milner's uh, Kindergarten and all of those, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're front groups, you're right. Yeah, they're just 100% front groups. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of uh, smaller groups within the secret societies are front groups uh, for the Jesuits. The Jesuits, as I have maintained, and uh, others uh, like Greg Szymanski, Eric John Phelps, uh, all of our research uh, ties together and uh, confirms what each of us has worked on separately. And it goes back to a lot of guys who have written good books like Edmund Paris, The Secret History of the Jesuits. Uh, it just all dovetails and points to the same point, and that is that the Jesuits sit at the very top of the secret society's pyramid, controlling Freemasonry, controlling their own Jesuit order, and through that, controlling the entire hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church because the black pope actually rules over the white pope. He's the black pope, the Jesuit spirit general, is the power behind the throne of the white pope, the one that we see patting children on heads. But the, the real leader of the Roman Catholic hierarchy is the Jesuit superior general, who's also in charge of the very wealthy knights of Malta who are co-located and co-headquartered uh, at uh, the uh, Jesuit uh, Superior General's palace there in, in the Vatican. So uh, this man is by far, I think, uh, the most powerful man in the world. Uh, and through the wealth he controls, through the Vatican Bank, and again through these wealthy Knights of Malta who hold a lot of key banking positions, uh, the Rothschilds, people like to point to them and say that they're, you know, hey, look, these are Jews and they're running everything. The Roth 
Rothschilds are, are Jesuits who just happen to have a Jewish background, but uh, one of their titles is Guardians of the Vatican Treasury, and uh, that ought to tell us something. They're employees. But, yeah, exactly. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I just wanted to, to let them know that I, I've got a good in, uh, background in intelligence, but interestingly, with despite having for 26 years, they're almost the full 26 years, uh, I had a top secret uh, special intelligence uh, clearance with all kinds of extra caveats and that, and I knew almost nothing about the Jesuits. I knew a little bit about the Catholic Church, and I'll explain why um, with my religious background here. And I was raised Methodist. My mom was Methodist. My dad was Roman Catholic, but my dad got in trouble because he didn't raise us Catholic, and the priest was angry with him for years. So, again, I was never baptized a Roman Catholic, and I never – actually, I didn't go to a Roman Catholic church till I actually – got in my 20s, I went a couple times with my dad to Mass. But again, I was raised uh, Methodist. Um, now, I have to say this, 90% 90, 90 of my relatives are Roman Catholic, including my dad is over 80 years in the Catholic Church. 90% of my friends are Roman Catholic because I'm in a very heavily Roman Catholic area that anywhere you go in a, any direction, about five to six miles until you get down off the mountain, it's either 70 to 90% Roman Catholic or higher. So I live in a very, uh, decades ago, by the way, I married a, a beautiful and wonderful Roman Catholic lady, and that's when I took Roman Catholic catechism classes. I was still in the Air Force uh, up at Syracuse University uh, studying Russian language, and uh, I, I went to those classes, and I never converted to Catholicism. As a matter of fact, the priest kind of threw me out after about six sessions uh, because I kept asking questions. And I wasn't a, a Bible scholar at the time, but I had read enough of the Bible to, you know, just raise questions like, hey, uh, Jesus Christ healed Peter's mother-in-law, and Paul said that, it, that Peter, Simon, uh, took his wife with him when he went around. Uh, it sounds like Peter was married. Uh, why you guys have to be celibate priests when, you know, it looks like Peter had a wife there? And the, and the priest said, oh, is that in the Bible? And then, uh, uh, then I nailed him on about four or five other things, uh, and it finally just came up after about the sixth session and put his arm around me because I was embarrassing him by asking him questions he couldn't answer <laughs> and uh, or, or making him look stupid because he kept saying, is that it really in the Bible? You know? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, it is. I says, why do you – just give one more example. I, I said, uh, Christ said – um, don't call anyone on earth father. Now, obviously, he's not talking about your earthly daddy, but he was talking in a religious. So why do we have to call you guys father? And he goes, is that in the Bible? I said, yeah, it is. And I'll give one more. It is because sure, it's good. Yeah. And I goes, I goes um, Jesus Christ said, but we shouldn't do repetitious prayers like the heathen do. Why do you guys pray the rosary and just keep going over the same thing over and over and over again? And he, he goes, is that in the Bible? And uh, and I, I'm not picking just on Catholic priests because I knew six Methodist ministers, and uh, uh, I'd say probably about four or five of them uh, didn't know that much about the Bible. As a matter of fact, their main training was in administration and raising money and public speaking and uh, running social and things Philosophy. like that. <laughs> yes. And I think, as a matter of fact, the last couple of Methodist um, ministers that I knew uh, said they only had one Bible course when they were in. And, of course, Roman Catholic priests, if you talk to ex-priests and that, they get very little Bible training. And uh, theirs is almost all the uh, traditions uh, of the church, the church, old church fathers, especially the ones that the Catholics consider the most important. And that, that's their main study there. They don't, also don't get into the Bible. So anyway, because of that, this guy, he just come up, came up, put his arm around me and said, you don't have to come back anymore, my son. And I didn't want to go back anymore anyway, Gordon, because uh, the snow was getting about three to four feet deep up in Syracuse at a hellacious winter that year. And that, so it worked out well, but he, he definitely didn't want me to come back. So I am not Roman Catholic, although I love a lot of individual Roman Catholics. And, and I want to just make that point. Uh, again, I, I just went to Mass a couple times with my dad, uh, kind of rebellious there because I, I was kind of disgusted by the Methodist church. And then for six or seven years, I, I went to independent fundamental churches here when I uh, got, came back after leaving the National Security Agency. And I got so disgusted with them because everything was pre-trib rapture. 
the once saved, always saved. Uh, we're not to be involved in fighting evil. We're only here to win souls, and, and we're to obey government no matter how evil it is, don't oh, you yeah. know? And and that just drove me crazy. So uh, basically, I just read the Bible, and uh, I get together with a couple of friends. And by the way, uh, before we finish, I'd like to give a book. It's the best book for Roman giving to a Roman Catholic that really – in a nice and kind way, it's Lorraine Bettner's book called Roman Catholicism. They've attacked this man horribly. It was written, I think, in 1962. But uh, Roman Catholics tell me it's the best book to give to a Roman Catholic uh, to witness to them as to the unbiblical, unscriptural doctrines and practices in the church because uh, Bettner, uh, he's a man, Lorraine Bettner, I just... Uh, just runs comparisons. What This is what the Bible says. This is what the Catholic Church does or practices or says. And you, and anyone who looks at that with an honest and open heart is going to see that basically, and I, I, I don't know how to say it in a, a kinder way or anything or more, but it, it Roman Catholicism is basically paganism with a very thin Christian veneer. And the sad part is is that there are Roman Catholics, and I know Roman Catholics, that are real Christians that are in that church. And maybe before we get done, we'll read that verse, Revelation 18.4, where it says, Come out of her, my people. But um, Daryl, I took your advice. Last year I heard you talk about that Lorraine Bettner book. And I have a, one of my best friends is an ex-priest. Now, he still attends Mass, but he's no longer a priest. Uh, great guy. Uh, I, um, yeah, I bought that, a copy of that book and gave it to him last year. And uh, we talk, we were, he, he was talking about, you could tell it was really making him think, uh, but I haven't heard back from him in a few months, so uh, it'll be interesting when I do hook up with him again. Well, the good news I have is that my best friend and his wife, and he was a Eucharistic minister. She taught, uh, I forget, uh, catechism-type classes in the in the church school, and both very, very devout Roman Catholics, both from devout Roman Catholic, large Roman Catholic families, and after over 50 years, each of them in the Roman Catholic Church, they... By reading the Bible and Bettner's book, they came out of the church. So it's it's not an impossibility. It does happen. And Roman Catholics, many of them have no idea. They know there's some evil at the top because of the pedophile priest thing. But many of them have no idea because they most of them do not read the Bible. They have no idea of how many Catholic practices like celibacy, infallibility, purgatory, uh, again, indulgences, um, mass cards for the dead, um, people trying to pay and pray their relatives out of uh, purgatory, that none of that's in the Bible. There's, as a matter of fact, uh, I challenge Catholics when I meet them, um, hey, sit down and read your Catholic Bible and see if you can find one pope. See if you can find one cardinal. See if you can find one archbishop. That whole entire hierarchical system is not there in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Paul and Peter, uh, examples in the New Testament, when anyone ran up and fell at their feet and tried to kiss their toes or uh, praise them as gods, uh, uh, they said, get up, get up, get up. We're, we're just men like you. Yeah. And compare that to the, the Pope, many of the popes that have lived in the... Uh, and such wealth, and uh, with many palaces, and card the cardinals the same way, and again through selling indulgences was what got Luther so fired up. A lot of people forget that the, some of the reformers were Roman Catholics. Uh, Luther was an Augustinian monk who tried so hard to reform the system from within. And, uh, the Dominican uh, Girolamo Savonarola, who was uh, in Florence, uh, led a great revival. Uh, he made one little mistake. He, he uh, criticized, I think it was Pope Alexander VI, his corrupt papal court. And of course, he was immediately excommunicated and, and murdered, you know, exterminated, uh, executed. And that happened so frequently throughout history. We need to remember that many courageous Roman Catholics have tried to challenge the system from within. And Rome, papal Rome, does not like to be challenged about anything. I'd like to read just a couple of little things that I threw in some of my writings. Writings when I started writing more and more about Roman Catholicism, it'll repeat a little bit what I said, but it's. I think people need to know this, and I have. Here's a little statement I put in some of my newsletters when I started to really go like after the Jesuit order. I am not a Roman Catholic. 
I also am most definitely not anti-Roman Catholic as far as individual Roman Catholics go. My dad, 90% of my relatives are Roman Catholic, and the majority of my friends are Roman Catholic still to this day, I might add. I am, however, against the top levels of secret societies, from the hierarchy of the Jesuit order to the hierarchy of Freemasonry. And by the way, uh, if I can find that quote, I'll read it later, but there was a, a historian that said, if you trace up to the very top of Freemasonry, you will find out that the leader of uh, the head Freemason in the world and the, the Jesuit superior general are one and the same person. Person. And we need to remember that, that the Jesuit order took over uh, French and British and German Freemasonry uh, over a century ago. So the Jesuit order controls the higher levels of Freemasonry, which gives them so much power because when you start looking at the intelligence community, uh, Gordon, you find out that uh, well, just about every head of the Central Intelligence Agency was either a 33-degree Freemason, like Alan Dulles, whom John Fitzgerald Kennedy fired, or or they were Knights of Malta, which is a religious military uh, order within the Roman Catholic Church under the direct command of the Jesuit Spirit General. I think that's kind of interesting. Five Knights of Malta, uh, the first one that was in charge was William Wild Bill Donovan. Uh, you had John McCone, uh, William Casey, William Colby, and George Tennant. You know, uh, there's at least five, plus the head of the decades head long of counterintelligence in the um, Central Intelligence Agency also sat the Vatican desk and the Israel desk was James Jesus Angleton who just happened to be the CIA liaison to the Warren Commission and you can tell and, and another uh, night of Malta and the FBI the assistant one of the assistant FBI directors Carthur Deloach was just happened to be the FBI liaison to the Warren Commission whitewash commission I call it and we can tell of the flow of information that went to the Warren Commission was was completely sanitized and edited by these two uh, Knights of Malta. So when you start looking at that in World War II where uh, the head of uh, Soviet intelligence is a Knight of Malta who uses Jesuit priests for his couriers named Prince Anton Turkel, uh, you look at the uh, German intelligence on the uh, Eastern Front, it's run by uh, a Roman Catholic Knight of Malta named uh, Reinhard Galen who ends up after the war coming over and helping and Donovan, who was head of the old uh, Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor, the CIA, they set up the CIA together. Two Roman Catholic Knights of Malta. Uh, by the way, w William Joseph Wild Bill Donovan, uh, I have a picture of him getting uh, the Order of Sylvester at, there at the Vatican. The man was heavily decorated by the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, for his a lifetime of service to the Catholic Church, even while he was the head of the OSS and then afterwards as a CIA director. So isn't that kind of interesting, Gordon, that uh, these guys are getting awards. Uh, our top intelligence guys are getting awards from the Roman Catholic Church. Well, you know, as you know, the Bible talks a lot about uh, nations being empowered by demonic entities. And when you read through that litany of the crossovers, between the, the Nazi echelon that were hooked up with the Knights of Malta, how they just very easily made that transition from crumbling Nazi Germany to rising United States 20th century power. And it's almost, boy, to me, I, I can just envision those demons crossing over from the Nazis to us, and we're seeing the fruits of that now all around us with entities like Blackwater and of course all of the the uh, the draconian legislation like the Patriot Act that includes stuff that says that the president's allowed to torture people. Yes. And where does torture come from? It doesn't come from any Protestant church. It doesn't come from any evangelical or independent fundamental church. There's only one church that is really tortured like big time, and that is the Roman Catholic Church and the Inquisition alone from, according to several reputable historians that officially ran uh, 1203 to 1808, butchered up to 50 million Bible-believing Christians. And um, while I mentioned that, I think it's important to everybody get a DVD. It's only $6. I, did, I don't know if you've ever had um, Richard Bennett on. He's an ex-priest of 22 years. But he did this DVD on the Inquisition. It's 
subtitled 605 Years of Papal Torture and Death. It's 58 minutes long. It's in color. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll tell them how to get it. Sure, yeah. It's $6 post each paid. At, in other words, it includes the shipping and handling, so these guys not making hardly a penny off of it. But if you get this DVD, like I said, it's 58 minutes in, in color, very professionally done, has nice music on it. As a matter of fact, it has an introductory song about the Inquisition. But the first two-thirds of the DVD deals with that official inquisition that took the lives again of up to 50 million Bible believing Christians. Many women, many women were burned. And you think uh, with wet wood uh, and just slowly roasted and toasted at the stake, uh, how cruel. Uh, 80 popes in a row approved the inquisition. Uh, but again, it's, it's very professionally done. And the first two thirds deals with that uh, 1203 to 1808 time frame. But the last third deals with that forgotten Holocaust. Uh, some people call it the Vatican Holocaust. And they're talking about in Croatia in the 1940s, Croatia was a part of Yugoslavia, then broke away, became a, a puppet state to the Nazis. And uh, this fascist state butchered, tortured uh, up to uh, one million innocent Serb Orthodox Christians. Men, women, and children to the point where they impaled children alive on stakes. They crucified Orthodox priests to wooden doors. Uh, they skinned people alive. They buried people alive. They burned people alive. Uh, they sawed them. They uh, cut their eyes out, made necklaces from them. And I know you're very familiar with this. Yeah, um, I read that book, the, the Vatican's Holocaust by Avro Manhattan. Yeah. And he has pictures in there of both the perpetrators smiling and, as they're sawing through some guy's neck. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, and they, as a matter of fact, two, and we need to think about this because there are 10 FEMA regions in the U.S. There are 10 Jesuit provincials assigned to the U.S. I don't think that's coincidence. And when we think that two Jesuit uh, prelates, they were uh, Jesuit monsignors who were in archbishop positions in uh, Zagreb and Sarajevo, respectively. Uh, Aloysius Stepanich, who also was the uh, military vicar to the Ostashi uh, military killing squads that ran around, and Ivan Saric. And uh, so these two J Jesuit uh, archbishops uh, ran uh, this uh, choreographed this horrible uh, religious side, basically. And the that, people who led the, the bloodthirsty mobs were Franciscan priests, correct? Yes. Mostly, most of, the, and some of the worst commandants were, yeah, you know, like you said, Franciscan priests, monks, and friars. They sometimes led the Ostashi units, and if they weren't the actual officer in charge, then they were an advisor that participated in and urged the torture. And as the one writer wrote, he said they weren't content just to kill people. They had to horribly torture them first. So this, you know, it boggles the mind of people who were, have not been brought up uh, Roman Catholic and who do not know the history of the Roman Catholic Church to think of a church that calls itself Christian uh, doing this type of thing. And then, so that was a carryover. That, that was still the Inquisition, right? The Inquisition never really officially went away. No, right? no. And that was a modern day Inquisition that we need to look at because as one writer, I think it was Manhattan himself, said it was. It serves as a model of what the Roman Catholic Church would like to do if they could ever, you know, wherever they have power to establish themselves as the state church and to totally, as the one uh, Edmund Paris wrote, convert or die with everyone else. You either, and of course, uh, some some of the uh, Orthodox people did convert, but again, this this DVD is it's critical for people to see whether they're Roman Catholic or non-Roman Catholic to see the barbarity of all this and uh, you can get that again for six just ask for the DVD the Inquisition and it's six dollars and you would make your check or money order payable to Richard Bennett and Bennett has two N's and two T's in it B-E-N-N-E-T-T -T. so Richard Bennett make the check or money order payable to him and mail it to Richard Bennett P.O. Box 192, I'll give it twice, P.O. Box 192, Dale Val, it's two words, D-E-L space V as in victory, A-L-L-E, Dale Val, Texas, T-X, 78617, again, six bucks, and he allows people to make 
unlimited reproductions of it. So if, if you get it and like it, you can just make as many copies as you'd like. Make your check or money order to Richard Bennett P and mail it to Richard Bennett, P.O. Box 192, Del Val, two words, D-E-L-V-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Texas, T-X. 78617, and that's probably the top thing I recommend people, because almost everyone can afford $6, and it's such a, it's a, it's a very well done, it's, uh, two guys do it, an ex-priest of 22 years, I believe, Richard Bennett, he's down there in Texas, and uh, Michael D. Simlin, both these guys have uh, written numerous books, uh -huh. and uh, they do an excellent job, and there's no unnecessary acrimony or any viciousness about it, it's just very professionally done, and I urge everyone, whether they're Catholic or non-Catholic, to get that DVD and watch it. Because if we don't learn the lessons of history, as Santayana said, those lessons repeat. And God help us if, if we, when FEMA takes over and the governors are the real power behind them are those ten Jesuit provincials because we know what these people can do. Here, uh, Here's a little thing I'd like to read, but I, I had stuck into several of the newsletters when I started writing more about Roman Catholicism. I put, why am I writing more and more about Roman Catholicism? I've been writing more on the Roman Catholic Church's hierarchy, and especially its Jesuit order in recent newsletters, because I keep uncovering more and more about the deep hatred that the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has for independent Bible-believing Christians, Protestants, Orthodox Christians, and Jews. And by the way, during World War II, it was just a bloodbath that mainly went after Protestants in Northern Germany, Orthodox Christians, not just just in Serbia, but in Russia and the Ukraine, and of course Jews, and up to six million Jews, despite all of these people that try to say that there were only you know, a couple hundred thousand. No, I've seen the actual pictures of the bulldozing of the bodies and that when the American well, soldiers went into camp, so that's, you go ahead. Let me derail you quickly here, because uh, you just prompted something. Uh, Daryl, do you think, as I strongly suspect, that um, not only during World War II, not only what happened in Croatia uh, with the, the mass murder and torture of the Serbs, not only was that a carryover of the same Inquisition, but do you think, given that Hitler is still to this day a Catholic uh, in title, he never was excommunicated, and given that it was uh, guys like Franz von Papen, uh, who uh, was was he a cardinal or an archbishop? Who? No, no, he was a he was a knight of Malta. Knight of Malta. And, okay. Yeah, and he put uh, Hitler into power. He Go put ahead. Hitler into power, and as we know, knights of Malta are under the auspices of the Vatican. Do you consider that the the far more fame, infamous Holocaust of that that we see so many movies and books about, like Schindler's List and whatnot? Do you think that that also was a carryover of the Inquisition? Without doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that th that was another – it was just part of the modern-day Inquisition. Serbia wasn't the only one. It, it, World War II was an entire Inquisition that uh, the Catholic Church has long hated Orthodox cri Christians. And that's why the Nazi SS units, a lot of them in the Central Security Service and that, they were priests that put on the black uniform. The head of the Nazi SS was not little uh, pug nose the nephew Heinrich Himmler, Kurt Heinrich Himmler, the real head of it, was his uncle, who was a, a Roman Catholic priest, a Jesuit, That's right. yeah. subordinate to the Jesuit Superior General Letikowski. But those priests followed in with the killer units, just like the Ustashi had the Franciscan priests, monks, and friars. These Jesuit priests and other Roman Catholic priests were even wearing the black uniform of the Nazi SS, and they were with the killer squads that came, came in behind the regular uh, German military. Whenever they, you know, invaded into uh, Ukraine and then further into the Soviet Union. So, yeah, it was a, a, a Eric John Phelps. When I first looked at his book, I thought, wow, could it be that this thing was just totally orchestrated to slaughter as many Protestants and Jews and Orthodox Christians as possible? And I don't know how anyone can really take a, an honest look at World War II and not come to that conclusion. Where did almost all the fire, fire bombing take place? Uh, 
Dresden. In northern Germany, yeah. not in Catholic Bavaria. What happened to the poor uh, German Protestants up in the northern and northeastern parts, like in Prussia and that? Uh, they were forced march during winter. Women and children died along the way. Uh, some people think up to a million uh, with that, and, uh, and the people that died in the camps in the northern part. The Americans in British camps were horrible. Uh, they allowed malnutrition. They allowed the weather and everything, uh, exposure of these people. Um, uh, they were tr horribly treated. The amount of food they were given in that, like I said, forced marched in the middle of winter. Um, and then, of course, the Jews, they went after them big time and then the Orthodox Christians. So I don't see how anyone can really be honest, whether he's Roman Catholic or non-Roman Catholic, look at World War II and not just see a, a just a massive religious side that was orchestrated by having Knights of Malta running the intelligence services on both sides. And, and we all need to keep that in mind. I worked 26 years in the intelligence community. When you have top positions like the, the CIA counterintelligence desk, uh, when you hold the, the head of the CIA, the head of the FBI, then you can murder anybody. And that's what happened with John Kennedy, and then cover it up because you, you have all your people at the key choke points, and no mid-level analyst or something's going to be able to get anything to – he'll get murdered if he, you know, tries to go outside of uh, channels. And, and, and that's what they did with the two liaison positions with Kennedy and everyone around Kennedy, and that's something that – uh, you and I have talked about before is the alternative media. Much of it blames everything on the Jews, uh, mentioning the Rothschilds and that, or, or uh, the head of the Federal Reserve, and not ever getting to the secret societies and the control of the secret societies by the Jesuit Superior General, where they have control of these, uh, not only the intelligence agencies, but uh, they are able then to use, uh, through the CIA cooperation with special forces, Navy SEALs, they are able to use our most elite military to murder people and cover it up. And, uh, and and having key people in Congress, almost every key committee is held by a Roman Catholic generally. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I started uh, when I was updating some of my uh, news articles. I, I, I might as well tell this story, and you know it. At one time, I had 106 articles up on the web, uh -huh. 106. Yeah. And, and a lot of them dealt with assassination, like the assassination of Kennedy, the assassination of John Paul I, the assassination of uh, Oscar uh, Romero, the Archbishop down in El Salvador, um, and, and, when, and the, the assassination of Lincoln. When you look around and start digging a little bit outside of uh, mainstream publishing and uh, the current American textbooks, you find out in all of these that the culprits are the Jesuits and um, the rest of the Vatican, the papacy. Uh, uh, clearly their fingerprints are all over the assassination of Lincoln. My goodness, you know, they even helped uh, uh, John Harrison Surratt to escape up to Canada where two uh, Roman Catholic priests hide him out, uh, one of the arch conspirators, and then they ferry him over to England and down to the, the papacy where he becomes part of the Pope's own personal bodyguard in a Zouave company. So uh, to, to, to have that kind of power. But Burt McCarty in her book pointed out that during the time, and she wrote an interesting book, The Suppressed Truth, about the assassination oh, yeah. of Abraham Lincoln. When, uh, that book was published in 1924, and when she did, she's got a great quote in there, and I'll just paraphrase it because I don't have it right in front of me, but she said that during the Wilson administration, that would have been, he served two terms, I think that would be 1913 to 1921, remember he's the president, said, I'll never send your boys overseas, yeah. just like uh, uh, FDR later, but anyway, she said during his administration, uh, the office of the, ar uh, the head of the Army, the head of the Navy, the head of the emergency fleet, the head of the post office, and she named a couple others, and she said just about every single department in the U.S. government. Now, remember, this is, this is in the 1920s, the early 20s. She said, was held by a fourth-degree Knight of Columbus. Now, the Roman Catholic population at that time was one-sixth the entire U.S. population. But there, they're holding every single key position. Lincoln said that in his time, half of the newspapers, I mentioned it earlier, half the newspapers were run by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and then after Tupper Saucy, when he came out with his book, Rulers of Evil, uh, showed how in the Reagan administration almost all his top advisors were Roman Catholic, and almost every key position, uh, intelligence, finance, in both the Senate and the House, were all held by Roman Catholics. And it's interesting when you think back, Gordon, 
if you go to an independent fundamental church, you'll find out these guys have all been taught in their seminaries. We don't get involved in politics. But when you go to Roman Catholic churches, when they have their Knights of, of Columbus and they try to recruit the young Roman Catholics into that, they tell their people, get into law enforcement, get into government, become mayor, become governor, become president. And they tell – so they're, they're, they're talking two sides there. They infiltrate, and that's – the Protestants have trouble understanding that because we wouldn't think of infiltrating a Catholic church. But the Jesuits are masters of infiltration, and they have their people infiltrate, even seminaries of these uh, 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 independent fundamental associations and everything. And they tell these people, now you need to obey government no matter how evil it is, how much, no matter how fascist it is, because don't you know government's from God, and you guys need to stay out of politics. You're only here to win souls. You don't get involved in anything. And then they're telling their people, get involved in law enforcement, get involved in politics. You go to these, a lot of these uh, northern, northeastern cities, uh, Midwest, North, uh, Chicago, New York, Boston, you'll find out that a very large number of the police officers, especially in the middle and higher levels, are Knights of Columbus. And you can see that on a website, uh, spirituallysmart.com. It's under blue mass, spirituallysmart.com. Dot com. Uh, I think it's one of the first ones in his left-hand column on his home page. He has a blue mass there, and they have all kinds of pictures. Of, uh, uh, Jeb Bush is a fourth degree, I believe, uh, Knight of Columbus. They have a picture of him uh, getting his ceremony there. Uh, they have a picture of President, uh, the current baby Bush, um, uh, shaking hands with a bunch of uh, Knights of Columbus. They have a pictures of some of these top people in uh, the New York police force. Uh, I think one of them was a former Homeland Security or FEMA. A female that was a very high-ranking one. They're all Knights of Columbus. So what does that bode for us? The, uh, we need to remember something, Gordon, and that is, is that the Ostashi was a Roman Catholic militia called Catholic Action in Yugoslavia. Whenever the German troops poured across the border, these people turned on their own government, turned on their own constitution, their own people, and betrayed them and and showed the Nazis, uh, well, I should say the German troops, where uh, the arms were stored, where uh, aircraft were hidden away, and uh, they basically were a fifth column. And I hope that most of the listeners understand that fifth column from the Spanish Civil War there where General Mola said, or, and Franco said he had a fifth column. In other words, he had uh, people friendly to him behind the enemy's line pretending to, uh -huh. to be uh, uh, good guys when they were actually betraying them. But he claimed to have a, in Madrid, to have a fifth column. Well, throughout all of Europe, in World War II, there were fifth columns in France and Yugoslavia that betrayed they betrayed their own people, their own country, their own government, their own military. They assassinated that uh, King Alexander of Yugoslavia. Right. And But the Ostashi, we need to remember, was a Catholic, Roman Catholic militia, basically a terrorist group before World War II. And, and then once um, Pavlich was put into power there, Auntie Pavlich, an interesting character who said a good Astashi is someone who can cut a child out of its mother's womb, um, and having the two archbishops there, once they took power, well, guess what happened to the Roman Catholic militia, Catholic action, Astashi? They became the regular military forces, and they went around being the killer squads. And people need to think. I, I've heard a million and a half to two million uh, strong for the uh, Knights of Columbus. There are signs all over the, where I live. I mean, you see all these signs. They have chapters and stuff. They have. Uh, they sell insurance. They sell uh, uh, little gambling tickets, basically, that are based on the lottery here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> these guys are wealthy. They're powerful, and and we need to think. Are, are they gonna? What are they gonna do when we go under total martial law in a fascist state here? Are these guys gonna be just like the Ostashi in Croatia? That's something to think about because the knight, and I, you've probably seen it. That fourth that fourth degree oath of the Knights of Columbus. Now they've probably mellowed it some, but it was, it was a horrible blood oath that was read into the congressional record in the early 1900s. Um, Knights of Columbus, you know, we don't need militias that have an oath to a foreign potentate, and that's what the Pope is. And if people think that's hard, it's it's just the truth. Cheryl, and, 
Well, Go ahead. When you say foreign potentate, now that brings the, up a good point because we talk a lot about Roman, the dangers of Roman Catholicism and, and the Jesuits and the, uh, the upper echelon of that hierarchy. But um, the, the, that upper echelon, foreign potentate, isn't the real threat, the real source of all this threat is because it is that the Vatican, because the Vatican, people think it's it's part, just, just a religious system still. No, that's a nation state, is it not? It is. The Vatican State is has diplomatic relations with uh, something like over 80 or 100 countries, I forget. But th they're a member of the United Nations. The Pope goes and speaks there, and, and I'm pretty sure they are. And I know they've got diplomatic relations with all of the major countries in the world. As a matter of fact, they were restored with Mussolini in the concordant, concordant that he signed uh, with the papacy. And, of course, some people tend to forget uh, Hitler also signed a concordant mm -hmm. with the papacy. And and you mentioned earlier, Hitler was never excommunicated, neither was Mussolini. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Hitler died, or some people say he didn't really die, he went to Argentina, but anyway, when he, uh, he was supposedly uh, uh, committed suicide, they had a high requiem mass for him in Spain. Officiated, I think, by three Roman Catholics. You, generally, that's only for like a cardinal or something. And they had that for him. But Mussolini, Hitler, and none of the worst of these mass murderers was ever excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church. How could they? These guys were working for them. You know, that's not good PR within your own camp if you uh, excommunicate your your uh, your top murderers that uh, carry out your orders for you. Hey, let me uh, go ahead and finish a little bit here. I, I put here, we Americans have for the most part, oh, let's say one other thing. You mentioned a good point. So a lot of people tend to think of Roman Catholicism as just a religion. No, the Roman Catholic Church is probably the most powerful geopolitical faction in the world because of control controlling secret societies, plus having uh, a billion adherents, plus having a Vatican bank, and then they have another bank too, but uh, all their stock holdings in that, the Knights of Malta are big bankers, so they're filthy rich, and so we need to think of them, they are the, the most powerful, in my mind, geopolitical and financial power on the entire planet. They're not just a religion. So anyway, I put here, we Americans have, for the most part, been largely ignorant of the well-documented history of the Roman Catholic Church in conducting brutal religious genocide, the Inquisition, holy wars, and holy crusades against all the aforementioned groups, talking again, Bible-believing Christians, Protestants, Orthodox Christians, and Jews. Sadly, many Americans believe the ecumenical rhetoric of the Roman Catholic Church's hierarchy, that she has changed her ways and now loves all the separate brethren. Separated brethren. Well, we now know that the current Pope, Benedict XVI, is come out and said, well, that liberal stuff you kind of heard out of adding it to is they're just spinning that the wrong way. You know, we uh, there's no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church, and I've got quotes somewhere some by, by him in some of his recent documents where he said any church that came out of the Protestant Reformation is not a church. So guess what, Protestants? You're back to being heretics and not separated brethren. And by the way, the ecumenical movement totally run by Roman Catholics. Uh, there's a Roman Catholic priest named Forrest and that, but you'll find it almost all of these, uh, the Billy Graham things and that. There's always priests there. Uh, uh, Paul and Jan Crouch, you could almost always see a priest in the background there. Uh, Jack Van Impe uh, praises uh, um, Mary and the Marian apparitions and the popes. So so a lot of these uh, so-called Protestant evangelists and that are just, well, Billy Graham himself has a uh, honorary degree from a Roman Catholic uh, Institute wow. of Higher Learning. Learning. Go ahead. They're all subverted. Yeah. They, they're working for the other side. And, and we need to realize that, that, that these people are Pied Pipers. They're, as a matter of fact, Billy Graham, when a Roman Catholic comes forward at his crusade wanting to truly learn more about Christ, what does Billy Graham and his, uh, those counselors do? They turn them over to the local Roman Catholic Church. They go back to your Roman Catholic Church and, and learn there. I mean, again, I'm not trying to be mean to anyone because I love a lot of individual Roman Catholics, but Roman Catholicism is basically pagan. It's the old Babylonian religion. The Babylonian it's paganism. religion, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's paganism with a thin veneer of Christianity. It, it moved into the power vacuum whenever the imperial pagan Roman Empire fell, and, and the Pope 
basically took over as, as the ghost rose from the uh, ashes of the pagan imperial well, Roman Empire. Daryl, this gets into eschatology. You have these pre-tribbers, these fut futurist Christians nowadays who are expecting some kind of revived Roman Empire in the future, and what they are obtusely not seeing is that when the secular government of Rome fell, it it wasn't it, just a few years went by and then it 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 morphed into uh, basically what I'm trying to say is their revived Roman Empire is Catholic, Roman Catholicism because it, it it became it carried on Rome and engulfed all the other states around it infiltrated <clears throat> so it's right in front of them it's always been in front of them it's always been the number one persecutor of Christ, Bible. true Bible believing Christians, including the and I'm sure you you, you covered the Waldenses. I know you read yeah that was about them. You know how they treated the Waldenses, but they called the the Albigenses, the Waldenses, uh, heretics, Manichaeans, uh, dualists, all kinds of dirty names. But they were basically just simple Bible believing Christians who were always. Let me repeat that. They didn't leave the Catholic Church. They were always outside the Catholic Church, and because. Catholics in France and that started who would see and they compared how the wonderful lives of these people, they were hard working, industrious, um, moral people, and so the Catholic Church was starting to lose uh, their adherents, were, were leaving in droves uh, to join these people, and that's when they crushed the entire southern population of southern France. They exterminated the Albigenses in a series of crusades. I think they started somewhere around 1208. And they basically used some of the same crusaders who had been down in the Middle East and turned them loose, and uh, including rapists and murderers, out of the prisons to slaughter these people. And, and that's why I started writing more and more about Roman Catholicism, just because I don't know how to say this in any other way than, than the Roman Catholic Church is basically, especially the Jesuit order in the last four centuries, it's International Murder Incorporated. They're just mass murderers, masters of, of assassination of individuals, but also masters of religious genocide. And we need to speak out about it. We need to, Roman Catholics need to learn. I think if Roman Catholics in America could learn one-tenth of the history of their church, supposed church, but again, remember, it's, a, it's, a, it's an official uh, nation state, the Vatican State, um, with, that was restored by Mussolini with his concordat. I think it was in 1924. But anyway, by the way, Roman Catholicism also became the state religion again there. So the, the deadly wound kind of got healed there whenever they got back uh, as, a, as a Vatican state. But um, mm -hmm. the point, uh, I'd like to let people know what my web, if you don't mind, let them know sure, the website, yeah. because there's a lot of articles up there, and I have written more about Roman Catholicism. My website is toughissues.org, issues is plural, tough issues, I-S-S-U-E-S -S -S -E dot org. I had to change it. We'll go back to that story. I had 106 articles up there on the web at one time, mostly newsletters, and they, uh, they had been hacked into because I think I'd written about assassinations and the POWMIA issue. They don't like you to write about that, all the guys we left behind. And so it got messed with several times. We finally got it all back up on two different websites and the one website was simply hooked into the first website and the lady that was running, and I won't go into detail here, but she pulled all 106 articles and newsletters I had up there because I'd used several quotes from Seventh Day at Venice. And unfortunately, I'd also used a quote quotes by Hitler, but that didn't make me a Nazi. I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist, by the way. I'd use quotes by Stalin. That didn't make me a communist. But anyway, I'll use quotes by anybody if I think they're pretty good. But anyway, 106 got knocked out, and I been slowly rebuilding it back, and I've got 39 articles up there. And since you and I have both been talking about genocide here, I w would really like the listeners to just read two articles I got up there. One's called Bloody Hands and Wicked Hearts. It'll just show up under Bloody Hands. The other one is Death by Government and Death by Church. It'll show up there, Death by Government. Read Bloody Hands and Death by Government. And you'll find out it's not the Jews, the Zionist Jews that are running around fomenting all the wars and, and uh, fomenting World War I and World War II. It's, it is the Roman Catholic Church very clearly. And there was a man named Edmund Paris who was born Roman Catholic, a 
French author who wrote several books like Convert or Die, but he wrote The Secret History of the Jesuits. I think people can still get that from uh, Jack Chick, Chick Publications. And that's why I'm recommending they go up there and read my articles, my newsletters, because I'll, I give a lot of books, so I won't give any more. They can, other than I want to give them Bettners before we close up. But uh, Darryl, they need to read those so that they can see I've got all different kinds of websites they can go and look at, and I've got I've got uh, books and DVDs and that. I don't sell anything, but I recommend that they uh, to get those materials to do more in-depth research for themselves. Go ahead, Gordon. We spoke of that book, Roman Catholicism, by Lorraine Bettner, as right. as the maybe the best book to give your Roman Catholic friends to get them out of that system, to wake them up. But but just if people are interested in checking that out, that last name, Bettner, it's a very unusual spelling, is it not? We should probably spell it for them. Right, and I'll, I'll give them that information now because we've got about 10 minutes left or so. Um, it's The book is simply called Roman Catholicism, and it's by Lorraine Bettner, L-O-R-A-I-N-E. Bettner is spelled B-O-E, T is in tango, T is in tango, N-E-R. But if they just ask for the book Roman Catholicism and even spell close to Bettner, they can get it. It was published in 1962. It's a 466-page paperback book. And I'll have to give them an address because these people don't take credit cards. It's it's only – it's for that large of a book, it's got a really nice index in it, annexes. Uh, it's $15 postage paid. That includes your shipping and handling. And you, you get it through the conversion center. So make your check or money order for $15. $15 payable to the conversion center and mail it to the same place, the conversion center. I'll give the address twice. P.O. Box 265, Carthage, like the old Carthage in North Africa, C-A-R-T-H-A-G-E, North Carolina, N.C., 28327. So again, $15, check or money order payable to the Conversion Center. Mail it to the Conversion Center, P.O. Box 265, Carthage, C A R T H A G E, North Carolina, November Charlie, 28327. Folks can tell I was in the military, NATO phonetics there. But anyway, it's um, my best friend and his wife. They have uh, four children, and they gave them Dave Hunt's book, and it really turned them off. Dave Hunt's book is a great book, A Woman Writes the Beast. I like it, but I've heard from several Catholics that it really turns Catholics off. It's all and, factual, but it's too much at once Yeah, for new pe- newcomers. And it's a good book. If you're a non-Catholic, I would highly recommend you can get that from Chick Publications. And, and again, my newsletters will tell you how to get those books. But it, A Woman Rides a Beast is a great book for a non-Catholic because it, it gets into their doctrines in the back, like he gets into papal infallibility quite a bit, a celibacy and a purgatory, and he'll give you definitions of all of them. But, but he gets a lot into the genocide too yeah the, um, the sordid history of the popes hunt gets into in spades yes he does a very good job so again uh, but if you want to to hand something to a roman catholic to read because you want them to see that their church's practices and doctrines are unbiblical unscriptural roman catholicism is the best book and i tell you why he that man has been horribly attacked by the roman catholic church because he's right on the money and again he doesn't do it in a caustic and vitriolic nasty manner he he just lays it out nice and just pleasant and just saying here it is this is what the bible says this is what the catholic church says so i highly recommend it you get get that book and get it to into the hands of catholic friends it's much better received than than most other books let me uh, give a bible verse here and it's it's critical we're very ignorant of history we're also uh, biblically ignorant in america and i'm sure you're very well this verse hosea 4 6 <clears throat> my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge i will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy god <clears throat> i will also forget thy children that's pretty serious we need to be bible readers you mentioned about uh, the papacy and how easy it is to see you know some people try to predict who the uh, Antichrist is going to be. Some people said it was Gorbachev with the little red mark on his head. Some people even said it was Reagan. Uh, 
there's uh, Prince Charles. Uh, there's been many candidates. Mussolini was a candidate. Hitler was a candidate. You know, of course, these guys are dead now. Rather than trying to predict who the final CEO of the Satanic Kingdom is going to be, uh, as uh, that pre ex priest of 22 years, Richard Bennett, points out on his DVD, The Inquisition, the Bible very clearly lays out that the papacy is the Antichrist. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of verses very quickly. In verse Ch Revelation, and by the way, folks, Roman Catholic scholars who are prophecy scholars have come to the same conclusion. There's several of them. But in chapter 17 of Revelation, if you read 17 and 18, it pretty well nails it down. Talking about the great whore in verse 1, verse 2 says, with whom the kings of the the earth have committed fornication. Nobody, the, the papacy ruled with an iron fist, by the way, uh, continental Europe for over a thousand years. Uh, anyway, it says the inhabitants of the earth are, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The Bible talks of that like a spiritual fornication. The woman sits on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, this is key, and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Well, what are the colors that the cardinals and the archbishops wear in the Catholic Church? They wear purple and scarlet. Decked with gold and precious stones. Nobody has more gold than the Vatican. Upon her for Verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. If you'll study the Roman Catholic, there's a good book by Hislop. It's a little dry, kind of scholarly about the two Babylons, you'll see very closely that the, ba the priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church smells exactly with the confessional, exactly like the Babylonian priesthood. Yep. But anyway, the great a mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. We just got done saying, if you get that DVD, you'll see 50 million Christians by reputable historians slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The angel said, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her. This is in verse 7, which have the seven heads and ten horns. And then you go down to verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now someone like Tex Mar says that's Jerusalem. But <laughs> Jerusalem never ruled over all the kings of the earth. Some people say Rio de Janeiro has seven hills. Now the only place with seven hills that ruled over the kings of the earth for uh, oh, probably over 1,200 years was the Roman Catholic Church of Papacy. De crowned kings and emperors and deposed them. The, couple, the few emperors and kings that ever went against the Pope, most of them lost in, on the battlefield because the Pope would rally one, several countries. Some people used to joke, Stalin said, well, how many divisions does yeah. the, the Pope have? He, the answer is he has as many divisions as the U.S. or the Soviets or yeah, whoever the, is he's they, controlling. They've infiltrated and decapitated those governments. Exactly. And then verse 18 says, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Again, that's, the, the Israeli kings, the king of Judah, even David and Solomon at their, at their peak didn't rule over the kings of the earth. They ruled over maybe the kings of Edom and Moab and, you know, the Syrians, but they didn't, they didn't rule over the Assyrians. They didn't rule over the Babylonians. They didn't rule over the Chinese. But the, the papacy ruled over continental Europe for like I said, over a thousand years. But here's a verse that's kind of interesting. I used to say, I'm not telling Catholics to come out of the church. I am now. Verse 18 in Revelation 4, verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The Bible says that papal Rome is going to get burned in the end. And I would say to, and I love again many individual Roman Catholics, get out of there. Not only only is your church, which is a, 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 a state, a geopolitical and financial entity, not only is it guilty of pedophilia to the maximum extreme, not only is it guilty of up to 40% of American nuns report being sexually abused. That You can find that in a Boston Globe article. Uh, I'm looking for the book, but it's in a great book called Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church. It was wit written by a Roman Catholic named Kennedy. Not only is it guilty of all that, but if you'll read my bloody heart's 
article, you'll find out that the Roman Catholic Church, as Baron de Panay, the French statesman, said, it, its history is written in blood. Blood is what it's all about. Uh, the slaughtering Jews left and right, uh, as you well know, Gordon, whenever the Roman Catholic Crusaders, not the Christian Crusaders, went into Antioch in 10, I believe it was 1096. The Roman Catholic Crusaders slaughtered every man, woman, and child, Christian, Jew, and Muslim in Antioch. Then they went down, and in Jerusalem in 1099, they slaughtered just about, there were a few Muslims that bought their way out rich ones. But other than that, they slaughtered every man, woman, and child, other than the few that bought their way out, Jew, Muslim, and non-Catholic Christian. And that has been the history of that church. Before the Crusaders even went down to the Middle East, they went into the western provinces of Anjou and Puteaux and practiced up for the Crusades by, by slaughtering every Jew they could find. They gone through the villages of those western, I probably uh, murdered the pronunciation, but those western provinces in France, they practiced up. And it's just their entire history is nothing but religious genocide. Every 50 to 100 years, the Roman Catholic Church goes on a mass murder spree, and they did it as recently as the 1940s. And, and Gordon, that's why I think you're staying in and, and working hard at what you do, why I am too, because we smell what happened in, in Croatia, what happened all over the European continent in the 1940s may be coming to a neighborhood near all of us soon here in America, like they used to talk about movies going around the drive-in theaters. It's coming to a neighborhood soon near us. And again, 10 FEMA regions, 10 Jesuit provincials assigned here, and we've got the fascist police state almost totally set up here in America. If Roman Catholics do not leave in droves as they did during the Reformation. The only thing that stopped this, uh, that flow was the, the sword and the stake that the Catholic Church wielded against its own people. Otherwise, Europe would be totally Protestant right now. And that's why the Inquisition was instituted and carried on. And again, 80, 80 popes in a row. And if you're a Roman Catholic, get a book called uh, the Vicars of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy by Peter DeRosa. There's a Roman Catholic that just gave you the real nitty-gritty of what the papacy was about. It was nothing but r rich arist aristocratic families battling with each other. Most popes were murdered, by the way. Very few died natural deaths, um, uh, some mysterious, but uh, many of them were murdered because they were fighting with each other to, for the coveted position because of all the wealth and power that it carried with it. So, uh, again, we're not being mean. We don't hate Roman Catholics. We're just trying to warn you, your, your system, it's not biblical. It's a murdering system, and it's a system full of pedophile priests, and it's just it's a real sad story that it calls itself Christian. And in any country that Roman Catholicism, and then I tell Gordon, I tell my Catholic friends this, you're not going to like a Catholic police state here in fa fascist America. You, it's not going to be good for Catholics because the Inquisition didn't just kill Bible believers. Uh, many Roman Catholics were, if, if they were wealthy, uh, maybe you had a good-looking wife or daughter, they turned you in. And you went before the Inquisition, and very few people ever got acquitted from the Inquisition. By the way, most lawyers were not allowed to represent you. Uh, you couldn't see your accusers, so they had an almost 100% conviction rate. And that's why we're, we're warning people, you know, find out about this church, geopolitical, financial entity. Do a little bit of research. Check out, uh, there's some great websites, uh, spirituallysmart.com I mentioned. Also, uh, uh, Greg sismansky has got a good one with a lot of articles about the Jesuits. Um, ArcticBeacon.com, Arctic like an Arctic Circle, A-R-C-T-I-C-Beacon.com. I mentioned mine, Tough Issues. Dot org. Um, check those out, and you're going to find out there's a lot of articles up there. Uh, VaticanAssassins.org is also a good one. Eric John Phelps, VaticanAssassins, plural, dot org. He has a whole bunch of articles, so check it out. Do a little research. Check out this Jesuit order that has so much control in the intelligence community. A lot of the top uh, military guys in the Pentagon are also Knights of Malta. Remember Alexander Haig? He was a Knight of Malta. So we need to, we need to 
basically we need to get the Roman Catholics out of that church because anybody that's in the church supports the entire system, the hierarchy at the top. Whatever money you give, a lot of it gets sent up uh, through the bishop, up uh, to the archbishop, and to the cardinal. And so the papacy itself feeds off of an American Catholics have been major contributors. And we need to get secret societies out of this country. There need to be no dual loyalties, uh, Knights of Columbus, uh, Knights of Malta that take an oath that goes back to the Jesuit superiors and uh, right up to the Jesuit superior general and the white pope. Uh, Anyone that takes an oath in the United States, it ought to be to the U.S. Constitution and not to something that's going to override that. And that's what happened, Gordon, in all of those uh, countries in Western Europe and that, Central Europe, uh, France, Yugoslavia, is that uh, the Roman Catholics put their oaths that they had to their ustashis, uh, what we would see today, Knights of Columbus, Knights of Malta. That took priority over any oath they had to their own government and to their own countrymen. That's why it's critical that people learn about these systems, learn about secret societies, and learn about the Roman Catholic Church. And that's the only hope we have of saving America is that we get back to people who are patriotic Americans and don't have an oath to a foreign potentate, whether it's the white pope or the black pope. And I think you'll agree with that. Oh, yeah. Are you are you good for a couple of more questions, Daryl? I know we sure. haven't talked in a while. Uh, well, first, just a, a, a comment or kudos, I guess. I think you hit the nail on the head that when peop when Christians, when Bible believing Christians nowadays are looking for uh, who the Antichrist might be in, in in the world around them and in Scripture, um, yes, I they're they're being too myopic. They're looking through a microscope and they need to put the microscope down, back off, and just use their own eyes and look around at the landscape around them because they need to think in terms of systems. I, I think you're right. The Bible prophecy is much bigger than looking, f talking about a single entity uh, very often. I think it's, it's talking about an antichrist system. As you, and as you said, nothing fits the bill more, more yeah, perfectly. They need to read the book of Revelation. If, if you've never read it, uh, some people say you can't understand it. It interprets itself. I just told you uh, how the uh, about five verses after they say about the seven hills or the mountains that the, that the horse sits on, the angel says the seven hills are, I mean, I mean the seven heads are seven hills. It, you know, the, there's a lot in there that, that the Bible interprets itself if you'll read it. But I think it's like starting around chapter 13 and if you read through 18. I don't see how anyone can read that and not see the papacy as the Antichrist who butchered, up to, again, up to 50 million Bible-believing Christians. And well, that's all we're trying to warn about. And that's why I've written so much about genocide lately. Is And uh, uh, recently I started going against some uh, – or picking out some Roman Catholic doctrines because – the celibacy of the priests is a major problem with the pedophilia and with the uh, – it's not just the nuns. Women also have been horribly abused. And in that book, Lucifer's Lodge by Kennedy, he points out the problem with women being abused in the Catholic Church may be an even bigger iceberg there than – than the pedophilia, and that's something to really think about because wow. we know how much, the, how big the pedophilia was. And as you know, that satanic at the top levels, the, the two previous popes, Benedict XVI, the current one, and Pope John Paul II, both helped protect pedophile priests as much as they could. It wasn't just the cardinals and archbishops moving them around from parish to parish once they were discovered, but they actually flew them out of the U.S. when law enforcement actually, when we had some decent law enforcement trying to uh, circle in and catch these guys, they flew them off to Rome and put them up in luxury hotels in Rome and protected them. So if anyone thinks that these popes are wonderful guys, by the way, we might add Pope Benedict XVI held at least, I believe, five terms, multiple terms, I think they were five-year terms each, at the head of the Office of Inquisition. That is a little scary. The current pope is the yeah. grand inquisitor of, of uh, probably about 25 years' worth. And, again, folks, please do, you know, check out the different resources I have listed in my newsletters and check
check out some of those websites that I mentioned. Try to buy a couple of the books. The, the, the uh, Secret History of the Jesuits is an excellent book. You can get it from Chick, Chick Publications. That stuff's all up on the website. And I don't want to take you too long here. We've gone about an hour and five minutes here. So if, if, do you have any other questions? Yeah, just one, one last one, and then you can have the last word after that, by all means. But And, I, and you're probably going to have to speculate, but um, I don't know who I can talk to on this. Um, <laughs> Here, I'll just make it really succinct. Ralph Woodrow, did he succumb to senility, or did somebody get to him? I don't know. All I know is they say he, he kind of recanted, but he sure as heck wrote a very, very good book, and I, I have it here. What was it, Babylon Mystery Religion or mm -hmm. something? Yeah, an excellent book. It's no longer available. And that's why folks need to – you mentioned about books falling through the cracks. They need to get them. If, if, the final word that I would say here is, is not only do we need to get really read up on history – because these guys murdered several U.S. presidents. We need to get read up on our Bibles. And, and about 15 years ago, I started reading the Bible from cover to cover, the King James Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. We don't have two Bibles. We have one Bible. And we need to read the Old Testament as well, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, some really great reading in there. I realize some of it's a little dry at times. But you know what? Lincoln, when he was reading the Bible in the uh, White House, or what was the equivalent, uh, when the guy walked into his office, he saw him reading the Bible. He goes, Mr. Lincoln, why are you reading the Bible? Of course, this is what Roman Catholics tell a lot of their people. You can't understand it. And Lincoln says, no. He says, most of it is understandable. My problem is not with what I can't understand. My problem is obeying what I do understand. And most of the Bible is understandable, including the King James, which they claim is very archaic. Especially the King James, yeah. Yes. It's very easy to read. A lot of verses interpret themselves. Again, uh, the, you'll see a, an archaic word in three, le three verses down. It'll give you a different word. So it's critical. We can't be biblical e ignorant or we're going to fall for, you know, all this false doctrine that's running around like we have to obey government no matter how evil it is. Uh, we're going to be raptured out of here before anything gets bad. Uh, there's a lot of bad doctrine out there, and a, a lot of it I have traced to the Jesuits, even the pre-trib rapture. There are, there are a lot of Jesuits in and around the pre-trib rapture, oh, and that's why people need to study that. And I want to thank you for your hard work and, and for interviewing people like you, me. You know people like Alex Jones and Stan Monteith, and that'll never have me on. Oh, those guys are, you know, propagandists at best. They might be something worse. Who knows? But uh, you, uh, you stay in the fight. We need you. You're, you're doing a great work, and you have a great website, too. And do um, you want to tell them about your website? Oh, well, uh, what I'll, I'll tell them, it, well, if they found this, they know it's gordoncomstock.com. <laughs> That's but, true. But um, you know, I'd say still probably a majority of your writings, your recent writings, are, are up on my resources page. Yeah, I think you have all but the last seven. And, and like I said, I've got 39 up right now, and I think you've got about – 31 of them up there. Cause, uh, and the latest ones that I did, I did a refutation of Tef Smar's things I, I did about the protocols of Zion. Uh, here's another good one for them to check out, multiple choice quiz, because so many people in the alternative media say the Jews fomented the wars like World War One and World War Two. The Zionist Jews know. If they'll go up and take that 52-question multiple choice quiz that's up on my website, they'll find out who the real murderers, mass murderers and fomenters of wars are. It's not the Zionist Jews. So, again, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. And well, God bless you and okay. your family. Okay. You too, Daryl. And you take care. Okay. Bye now.